This podcast is brought to you in part by Sing and Dog Double Read Supply. Sing and Dog Double Reads is an online double read shop and one of the largest suppliers of high quality and affordable professional and student reads for oboe and bassoon in the USA. Please visit www.singandog.com to see all of their products. That's S I N G I N D O G.com. This episode is sponsored in part by MKL Reads. MKL is the one-stop shop for handmade oboe reeds where you can try reeds from various makers and select the one that is best for you. Visit mklreads.com and enter coupon code double read dish for free shipping on your first order. That's coupon code double space read space dish, all caps, for free shipping on your first order. Welcome to Double Read Dish. On this episode, we talk about our experiences with college auditions, give our shout outs, and present an interview with Nancy Ambrose King, where she talks about music, life, gratitude, and grit. Hi, I'm Galit Kaunitz. And I'm Jackie Wilson, and you're listening to Double Read Dish, a podcast for oboists, bassoonists, and the people who love them. Hey, Galit. Welcome to episode eight. Hey, Jackie. How's it going? Oh, it's going great. By the time this episode airs, we will be in spring break mode, full oh, on. I cannot wait. I'm so ready. I feel like my voice is like two octaves lower than normal this time because I'm just, I'm tired. I'm ready for a break. So uh, uh-huh. I hope our listeners enjoy this episode with Galit and Barry White. <laughs> <laughs> so around this time is when um, uh, auditionees start hearing back from their prospective colleges of choice. Yes, all my SEMO seniors are anxiously awaiting results, and I'm so sympathetic toward them and remember mm-hmm. going through that myself several times. Mm-hmm. Did you always have successful auditions when you were going through college auditions? <laughs> No. Um, (laughs) I look back and I'm like, oh my gosh, what a weird array of experiences. You know, uh, going into college auditions, I was a first generation college student. No one in my family had ever left home. Uh, No one had gone away. And so it was completely uncharted territory for me. I was overwhelmed. I was intimidated. I spent my warm up time in the practice room, like sobbing over like how freaked out I was and then you know you get to the audition and you play some scales and people are very friendly and especially I was auditioning at a regional uh smaller university and so Mm -hmm. you know you walk in holding the bassoon and they're like hi oh (laughs) (laughs) so nice to see you so you know quickly my fears were um relieved and then afterwards my teacher was like oh let's go have a lesson you know we can get to know each other and you can stop hyperventilating, and it was <laughs> wonderful. Please stop crying. Yes, I, I left the day feeling a lot better than uh, um, it started. What about your undergraduate audition experience? Oh man, I took a lot. I don't remember how many I did, but I I did a lot, and I remember my uh, my poor poor private teacher in high school had been telling me for years, you really need to focus. You really need to focus. You need to quit all this other stuff that you're doing and you need to to focus if you want to get serious. And I was like, yeah, I don't really think so. (laughs) So then by the time I got to my, uh, the summer, I think the summer before my senior year, and I had decided that I really did want to get serious. And then I was like, oh, my God, why wasn't I listening to her? And I started practicing like crazy. And then I took all these auditions. And some of them went OK, but some of them were just really bad. I auditioned for one conservatory. And, you know, I was like not super confident on all of my prepared pieces. So I was like, OK, well, I'll just start with the one that I'm least confident with, and then we'll move on to the one. (laughs) Finish strong. Yeah. And I would not recommend that strategy. (laughs) 
Probably. Because I, yeah. I never got to the pieces that I felt more confident with. Yeah, they're like, we're good. They, no, they're like, no, sweetie, you. we're good. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. I was like, but I, oh. <laughs> well, what about grad school? Did grad school go any better? Um, grad school did go better, but grad school, I think, is more of a, a fit thing. So, you know, a lot of people who are auditioning for grad school are really, you know, wonderful players. And, um, you know, teachers often have a more interactive, um, collaborative, collegial relationship with grad students. So I think if you're auditioning for a grad school and you don't get in, it's it it may not be like, oh, my God, I'm not good enough. It might just be like, well, we were looking for one thing, but, you know, we think you're wonderful and we wish we could take you, but it's unfortunately didn't work out this time. And, mm-hmm. and you know, if you are auditioning for undergrad or grad, um, make sure you take a lesson with the teacher because I think the, the first lesson is a pretty good indicator of how your relationship is going to be. And that relationship is incredibly important. Um, it's more of a mentor relationship than, than like a typical, like student teacher relationship, I think. So, so yeah, just go with your gut and good luck. And we hope that you have all of the success. Yeah, I really agree. I mean, when I look at my grad school, um, audition experiences, uh, for my master's, it was kind of a unique situation because my husband is a year older than me. And so he started a master's at the Boston Conservatory um, while I was finishing up my undergrad. And so I had kind of this choice to either um, start a master's in Boston or take a year off and uh, have my choice of where I wanted to audition. And so I took um, some lessons with Boston area teachers and fell in love with Matthew Ruggiero, who I ended up studying with and was kind of like okay well he seems like a great fit if I can get into one of his studios I'll go and if not I'll take the year off um but so I had several um lessons and I visited um the campuses that he taught at several times and I decided I really wanted to go to BU um so I could study with him but also it was a larger school of music they did stuff like Mahler and Strauss and that was an experience I hadn't had at that time um and so it was uh, a, a really nice fit, but what I didn't quite account for was, you know, I show up the day of, and there's a registration table, and I say, hi, Jackie Wilson, auditioning on Bassoon, and they go, okay, Bassoon, Bassoon, and they're flipping through these pages, and I'm looking down at the paper, and uh, they get to the Bassoon page, and there's over 20 names, Yeah. and mm-hmm. I've never seen 20 Bassoons in no. one place at one time, you know, I was totally big fish little pond at that point and so I remember just kind of being like (gasps) shell-shocked and um, went and warmed Mm -hmm. up and then went to wait outside the audition room and they're just sitting there like smokestacks (laughs) you know in a line (laughs) and you have to (laughs) hear one after the other as you're Uh waiting your turn and man some of them sound really good but uh, it all worked out and uh, yeah Going into my doctorate, though, I don't remember a lot about those experiences, but what I remember is the travel, because I was Mm -hmm. flying from Boston to places, mostly in the Midwest. We were looking to get Mm -hmm. closer to family and and that type of thing, Uh, but I don't think I had a time where the plane was not delayed significantly, (laughs) and one time I was returning to Boston by way of Detroit, and my flight got canceled and I spent the night in the Detroit airport because I was this you know poor starving grad student Mm -hmm. who couldn't afford a hotel room off budget Mm -hmm. and Mm -hmm. so I just called my mom on the west coast and said okay you're keeping me company because you know you also can't just go sleep as a 20 year old girl with a bassoon in the Detroit airport (laughs) right so I yeah I stayed up the entire night uh, oh, yeah. had a dinner of like, I don't know, Cheetos and beef jerky and mm. arrived in Boston <laughs> looking like I had returned from war. <laughs> yeah. And you just have to make it work. Yes, absolutely. Sometimes you get into town 3 a.m. the night before and you have a morning audition and it is what it is. You know, you make yeah. it work. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, you know, for all of you travel weary, exhausted, prospective grad students, we feel for you. So my shout out this week is, well, I have two. They're both articles. And the first one um, is an article sent to me by my good friend, Dion Chandler. Shout out, Dion. Um, (laughs) And it's an article on Chronicle.com. And if you are an aspiring um, person working who wants to work in higher education, this is a really great resource. It's the Chronicle of Higher Education. And they have a lot of articles about issues specific to um, higher learning. But this article is called Imposter Syndrome is Definitely a Thing. Some ideas for teaching your graduate students how to avoid feelings as if they don't belong in academe. And I think it's so great that people are talking about this. It's, It's not super new. It's November 2016. But It's really relevant, and I think grad school is sort of like prime time for imposter syndrome, especially, um, you know, um, first-generation college students, underrepresented groups within higher education. I think it's rampant, and um, it's good to educate yourself on different ways to deal with it and know that you're not the only one dealing with it. So we'll provide a link to this article. Uh, The second article is... A study published in the Journal of Research in Music Education uh, by faculty from University of Texas at Austin, UT San Antonio, and Texas Tech, Robert Duke, Amy Simmons, and Carla Davis-Cash. And the article is titled, It's Not How Much, It's How, Characteristics of Practice Behavior and Retention of Performance Skills. Um, published in 2009, but it's really relevant because it's a study done on basically uh, what Dr. Olson was talking about in a previous episode of inclusive practicing and how, you know, using many different musical elements at the same time and many different practices practice techniques at the same time increases retention. Um, and it's it's kind of cool. I was talking about what he was saying in the interview about, you know, inclusive practicing and making sure that you're doing everything, you know, you're thinking about everything at the same time. And I think Benjamin Coelho talked about this as well. And and my student was like, oh, I read an article about that. Let me forward it to you. And it's it's totally legit. It's really great. So we'll also... Um, post uh, the link to this article. Very cool. Mm -hmm. My shout out this week is a book by Malcolm Gladwell uh, titled David and Goliath Underdogs, Misfits, and the Art of Battling Giants. Um, So the whole premise of this book is using the story of David and Goliath to look at this um, phenomenon in which uh, the weak overcome the strong or um, looking in depth at resilience and where does that come from and uh, how do people achieve the unexpected um, when odds are seemingly um, against them or in scenarios where they shouldn't be able to succeed. Um, And I found it was a really good read. I felt it was really applicable to many areas of music, but I wanted to shout it out in this episode since we were talking about Um, college auditions and all those types of decisions. And um, I think it's in the second chapter, uh, Malcolm Gladwell goes really in depth about those types of choices. And um, say, if we're trying to decide between a a very prestigious institution or a, a very nice institution, which also happens to have a significant financial package or something like that, you know, that can be a really difficult decision and not everyone's going to find themselves in that particular scenario. But um, I feel like he gives some really good food for thought in how do we make those choices and how do we um, discern what is going to be the best fit. Um, and so I would really encourage listeners who are weighing those types of options and who maybe have a tough decision ahead of them, it's a really good resource to kind of give context to those thoughts. And I read it going, oh, wish I, I wish I had this, you know, 15 years ago. That would have been mm. wonderful. But I didn't. But <laughs> you can. And so I highly recommend it. Mm-hmm. 
This episode is brought to you in part by Gender Read Knives. Right out of the box, Gender Read Knives are the sharpest knives on the market. Each original Gender Read Knives is handcrafted using traditional Asian knife making techniques. Japanese steel is first forged into shape, hollow ground, and then hardened to Rockwell 5860, making the edge on the blade very strong yet durable. Each blade is then polished and hand sharpened to perfection using shaped in professional sharpening stones up to 8,000 grit. They even personalize your reed knife before sending it. You can choose a right-handed, left-handed, or straight burr, and choose which color sheath you'd like. I own multiple Genda knives, and I really love the 15K knife. It's sharpened to a whopping final grit of 15,000 using shaped in professional sharpening stones. This knife handles with extreme precision and effortlessness, capable of removing minute whispers of cane or purging unwanted masses from a reed. I actually let one of my students borrow this knife and try it out, and she is trying not to give it back. She just loves this reed knife so much, so I'm going to have to, you know, bribe or find some way to get this knife back in, in my possession. Um, but yeah, it's uh, super resistant to rust and has a lot of edge retention, and so I really like the 15K. You use Gendy knives too, don't you, Galit? I do. I have a few, and I like all of them, and I was especially interested in trying the student reed knife. Um, they have knives at different price points, and this is one of the most affordable ones. Um, it is really beautiful. The, you know, the blade is made with precision, and the handle is really lovely and it feels nice in your hand um, and it's keeps its edge really well and it's easy to sharpen and I think it'd be great for beginning reed makers who are just starting out on their reed making journey and they need good equipment to do so. So visit www.gendaindustries.com to check them out today. This episode is brought to you in part by JDW Sheet Music. JDW Sheet Music is an online store that specializes in original chamber music pieces for wind instruments. The website offers a variety of music transcriptions of composers like Debussy, Bach, Piazzolla, and Rachmaninoff. Owner and arranger Jessica Wilkins has produced over 60 chamber music arrangements featuring oboe and bassoon. Jessica's works have been performed at colleges across the country, as well as the 2015 IDRS conference in Tokyo, Japan. For access to the entire JDW Sheet Music catalog, please visit jdwsheetmusic.com. So full disclosure, this interview was so inspiring that immediately after getting off the phone with Nancy Ambrose King, professor of oboe at the University of Michigan, I went online and bought four etude books because <laughs> I was so fired up about practicing etudes. Um, we hope you enjoy this interview. She's really fantastic and inspiring and uh, can't wait to share it with you. So you guys requested, and we heard you, our number one requested oboe guest is Nancy Ambrose King from the University of Michigan. Thank you so much for joining us today. Sure, my pleasure. The question we always love to start with is having you introduce yourself to our listeners and talk a little bit about your education and training and how you got to the place that you are today. Well, um, I'm the oboe professor at the University of Michigan, and I've been here now 16 years, which is hard to believe that time flies so quickly. Um, before that, I was at the University of Illinois in Champaign-Urbana for seven years. And before that, I was at the University of Northern Colorado for four years. Before that, I was at Ithaca College for one year. So that's my teaching career. Um, my education, I grew up in Gross Point, Michigan, which is the suburb of Detroit. I went to the University of Michigan, which is my home state school, and I had studied with Arno Mariotti since the time I started the oboe. When I was 10 years old, he was my teacher. He was the principal oboist in the Detroit Symphony with Paul Pere and um, just a fabulous oboe player, incredible musician, and a wonderful teacher. And when he retired from the University of Michigan, or sorry, from the Detroit Symphony, he went to the University of Michigan as oboe professor. 
And I just wanted to keep studying with him because I had been with him since I was 10 years old. And so I went straight to U of M and he then retired after my sophomore year. So he was my oboe teacher from the time I was 10 until I was 20. Wow. And I know it was really remarkable. And uh, then Harry Sargis came in and, and I studied with Harry for the last two years in Michigan and, and he was terrific. And, after that, I went to uh, Eastman to get my master's with Richard Kilmer, who um, back then in 1984, he was just starting out at Eastman, actually. So it was my good fortune to be one of his first students at Eastman. I think I was maybe the second year of his teaching. So I, uh, I went to get my master's there at Eastman from 84 to 86. And then I moved to Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, for my first job, which was playing in a woodwind quintet. And the name of that quintet was Conspirito, and it was a full-time woodwind quintet job. And it actually paid enough for me to live on. Amazing. Surprisingly. I know, I couldn't believe it. Well, we, <laughs> we had a residency at uh, Duquesne University, which was fabulous. And that sort of got me into teaching a little bit, actually. I had my first student there, and... We played concerts, we went on tour, we had a tour bus sort of like Loretta Lynn or something, you know, <laughs> <laughs> Con Spirito on the side, and we drove all over the country, and we went to China, which was really amazing in 1986 to go to China, or 87. So, um, yeah, so I was there playing in this woodwind quintet and, and actually taking a lot of orchestra auditions and doing quite well in orchestra auditions at the time. And then um, many people know this, but I was in a terrible, terrible car accident in 1987, which we can talk about a little bit if you'd like to. So um, after that car accident, I was unable to play for almost two years I didn't oh play God. the oboe yeah and I had I was in and out of the hospital and had nine operations to sort of get me back and then I thought well gosh if I'm gonna try and make a go of this and try and play I'd like to go back to Eastman if Mr. Kilmer would take me because I implicitly trusted him and thought well if there's anyone that can help me play again it would be him and I really owe so much. I owe my entire career to him and and uh, at my mental and physical health, I think, too, because I went back to Eastman basically unable to play with a, just, you know, with a new, new face almost. I mean, I had broken my jaw and my nose and knocked all my teeth out. I had wow. a new wrist. And I mean, I had been really severely injured. And Mr. Kilmer started me from scratch on Barrett number one. <laughs> and that was 1989. And um, so, you know, the two of us worked together. And it was amazing how quickly, actually, um, I started playing once again. And at that point, I had a revelation, actually, that I was a 25, 26-year-old at that point, And I had... Um, all this knowledge that I had gained from playing the oboe for so many years and everything I'd learned from my wonderful teachers and summer festivals and all the things that I had had, uh, had done. and um, But yet I was sort of starting again as a, almost as a beginner with a, a new, new mouth, I suppose you could say, and new teeth and new jaw, new, new hand and a lot of surgery and so I thought, well, gosh, you know, I sort of have a unique opportunity here that um, has been given to me, although I wouldn't ever want to go through that again. I have a, an, a, uh, I was an adult beginner at, one, at the same time. And so I started um, really paying attention to as I was starting to play again, paying attention to things like, you know, why am I putting my embouchure the way I am. What am I doing with my air? Um, how am I situating the reed in my mouth? How much reed am I putting in my mouth? I was really um, thinking carefully through the whole process of playing. And I, 
I realized that I had a great opportunity at that point, and I, I thought I completely changed my um, focus of perhaps not becoming an orchestral player, but combining my love of teaching, my experience that I had been given, and also my interest in becoming a solo player and um, sort of uh, advocating for the future of the oboe in a solo way, in a sol- as a solo instrument. And that's basically how I got started. And then life just took care of itself. And that's where I am right now. That's so fascinating. Um, I imagine that after being in a severe car accident and having to start again as a beginner with all of the knowledge, like you said, of being such an advanced player already, that it was probably really frustrating. And do you remember what spurred your revelation from going, I would assume, and correct me if I'm wrong, but going from being very frustrated at having to start again to seeing it as a major opportunity? Yeah, that's a great question. Well, I think the main frustration actually came much earlier when I was trying to come back to playing too soon and and before I was actually able to do it. And that was extremely frustrating because there was nothing that I wanted more than to play the oboe. And yet I was physically unable to do it. And I realized through this whole process that actually my entire life or my my whole identity was pretty much wrapped up in being an oboe player. And so by the time I actually was able to start playing again, so we're talking over a year and a half later, by that point I had pretty much wrapped my head around the fact that I I probably wasn't going to be able to start playing the oboe again. And if I was, it certainly wasn't going to be at a professional level. And so at that point, since I had come to that realization over, you know, a year and a half of time, by that point, I was really just so excited by the fact that, wow, I think I might be able to do this again. And wow, it feels different and it's, I'm really rusty. And, um, but gosh, I think this might actually work out. And, and so by that point, I was really excited about the possibility. And I was really, um, I guess, still pretty struck by how quickly everything came back. So, um, once I got the, the green light to just, you know, go ahead and start playing again, it, it really came back quickly. And, and I tell my students that I don't think there's a huge difference between taking two years off and two months off and two weeks off. So I mean, mm. once you take off two weeks of time, those muscles are pretty much gone, those small muscles around our mouth and our, our lips. And, you know, in two weeks, they're pretty much gone. You know what it feels like to come back after two weeks. Mm-hmm. And it wasn't that much different, ironically, after two years. So um, I guess that's that's good news and bad news at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> well, you bring up your students, so maybe now is a good time to shift gears. We um, did a call for questions uh, on all of our social media, and we got one question that I thought was really interesting um, in the email, and it says, uh, my question is, since Professor King's studio is one of the most competitive and sought after in the country, I would anticipate that she has a lot of applicants and here's a lot of auditions every year. I would like to know what she looks for when she is evaluating an audition and what makes a student stand out to her, and also how she feels an admission audition differs from a professional audition. Oh, that's a great question. Well, I think what I'm looking for in an audition and in a person that comes to audition for me is someone who I really feel uh, will work well with me, who's open minded, who's um, excited about coming to the University of Michigan, who's excited about studying with me 
who is um, open to new ideas, open and curious to new repertoire, to new um, ways of doing things, and and for maybe a new future for the oboe. And of course, learning the old masters, and of course, learning the standard repertoire, but also um, someone who has a curiosity about taking the oboe to a place that none of us know exists at this point. So new repertoire, um, uh, new techniques, new things, uh, new ways of doing things that perhaps I don't even know yet, or, or you know, we don't know what the future holds. So um, I think a, a intellectual curiosity and intellectual curiosity, as well as, of course, an enthusiasm, a, a great work ethic, and musical talent and ability, of course, as well. Basically, the potential to build a playing career together with my influence and help is primarily what is important to me. Um, that said, I can say that there are always dozens and dozens more students that I would absolutely love to work with every year than I can possibly accept. And it's also, it's a, always a really tough call for me because when I do have to decide on the few students that I would um, eventually accept, uh, that I would like to accept many, many more that I would love to teach and I would love to work with and Unfortunately, I can't have 50 oval players at the school. <laughs> <laughs> so it's tough, but I always hope that, you know, the obo world is small enough, which, of course, as we know it is, it's small enough that I'll keep in touch with all of the students, whether they come to the University of Michigan or not, and hopefully have the opportunity to work with them down the road in some capacity. You have, I think, it's fair to say, an incredibly busy schedule during the school year. I always see you um, out doing double read days and giving concerts and headlining at IDRS. And you are also, um, you're the chair of your department at uh, University of Michigan. And I, I would love to know how you balance it all. You know, like... Mm -hmm. How you, how you can do it all and do it all so successfully. I heard you perform at last year's uh, Double Read Day at LSU, and I was just blown away. <laughs> you played the Pasquale, and I was like, oh, my God. <laughs> and I just, I'm so curious how, how you balance it all. And you also run marathons and where you travel, and it's, it's such an inspiration. First female president of IDRS. That's right. Yeah, that's right. Well, thank you. Um, there's a great old saying that if you want something done, then you ask a busy person. <laughs> I don't know if you've ever heard that, <laughs> but it's really true because I think busy people are really good at organizing their day and planning their time. And um, yeah, I, I do feel like I'm busy, but I usually don't feel like I'm overwhelmed and I just um, I have a lot of projects and I'm really uh, continually excited to go to work every day I don't think I should even call it work because I love more than anything teaching my students and I have to carve out time of course for myself to practice and and make reads so um, pretty much every minute of every day is accounted for, I will say that. Um, and that's probably one of the reasons why I like to go out and run every day because it's some time in the morning that I have that's just completely my own. And sometimes I just think and I come up with lots of ideas of future projects I want to have during the, that time. Sometimes I just put it on my headphones and listen to a book online or music or something just to have some time to um, just sort of be in my own world or my own zone. So I, I do think that that is, is really helpful. Um, 
Yeah, I mean, I, I've been playing the oboe for a long time at this point. So the repertoire, a lot of the standard, most of the standard repertoire I know pretty well. It doesn't take me long to, to brush it off and, and play it. Mostly I'm practicing to keep my chops in shape and, um, and be able to get up and play for a couple hours without getting tired. Um, but also I find that what really keeps me motivated to practice is to learn new repertoire and to have new pieces that composers may have written. I'm making a CD this May actually of the new American oboe concerto mm. or yeah. Yeah. I'm really excited about it. So I'm going to record the Alyssa Morris concerto and Scott McAllister's, um, grunge concerto that I played at IDRS. So sort of like the new concerto that has popular, um, themes or popular influences or even rock and roll or that grunge concerto is really edgy. So I think that that type of exploration of what's around the corner is really exciting for me. And that makes me want to come home after teaching and, and practice the oboe at night and make reads. And although I will say that right now after spring break, my read case is pretty much empty and that's what I'll be doing after I get off the phone with you. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Could you maybe talk to us a little bit about the Impulse Oboe Institute? I know that's one of your big projects that you do every year. And um, could you maybe describe what goes on there and what that project entails? Oh, sure. Yeah, Impulse is terrific. I'm so happy that the University of Michigan started this program um, probably 10 years ago now or 12 years ago. Um, So basically, there's a series of institutes for each instrument going on simultaneously. Well, not each instrument, but a lot of them. Oboe, flute, clarinet, bassoon, uh, gosh, trumpet, horn. There's a lot of them and some strings as well. And we it's for high school students. And pretty much these students are immersed in the oboe from eight in the morning and until they go to bed at night. And we have master class every day. They have lessons with me. They have uh, read class every day. It's really terrific. And they play chamber music with just oboes and English horns in the morning while I'm teaching and and they're getting some read help with some of my student assistants but also then in the afternoon they can uh, they're paired up with the other musicians from the other institute so they get to play chamber music that's mixed so woodwind quintets or quartets uh, all kinds of things so it's a it's a great blend between a, a really oboe centric high school camp, but yet having some mixed chamber music as well. And it's a two week program. It's really remarkable to see the level of growth in these students from the day they come in and until two weeks later, they're just uh, something about having the oboe in their mouth for eight hours a day. <laughs> <laughs> So it's really great, and they all have a great time. I have a great time. It's a, it's intense for sure, but it's really fun, and uh, the students really bond together personally as well as learning a lot about the instrument. Um, one of the other awesome projects that you do is very popular in my studio. Uh, your read making iBook. Can you talk about? Um, your process in, you know, writing a read-making manual and um, why you decided to publish it so that it's available online? Sure. Actually, um, I was not the instigator of that idea. It's an interesting story. So a lot of these double read days that I go around and, and teach at and play at will have as a component of the day a, a read hour or a read class. And I had done a a read class at a Fresno State Double Read Day in California a long time ago in the 90s. And at that point, there was was a a 
fellow there who was a, I think he was a student at Fresno State, and his name was Kevin Chavez, and still is Kevin Chavez. <laughs> and, uh, so it was a terrific double read day because at that point they had a an overhead projector, like a camera, and I was actually making a read under this camera and, and drawing some diagrams, and it was broadcast up on the screen. Well, little did I know that Kevin was actually recording that whole, uh, everything I said, he was recording and he was taking pictures of not only my hands, but of the, what was broadcast up onto the screen of my read diagrams and everything. And he was just keeping it for his own personal use, and, and which is terrific. So it was actually Kevin who approached me because many years later, maybe 10 years later, he was at that point working, he was a, had graduated from Manhattan School of Music and he was working for Apple computers. So at that point, he was sort of on, in the inner circle of, of these e-books or i-books that were just coming out at the time. And he asked if I would be interested in, in collaborating with him. And he was he was the editor. So basically, I at the time I said, oh, I don't even know how I begin to write a book, and I don't know that much about you know how to even describe my remaking. And he said, yes, you do, because I have it all. <laughs> <laughs> I heard you do it one, or, and I have all these pictures. So I so he sent them to me, and I realized, wow, you know, this will be really fun. So. I started out just writing, and once I started writing, it was amazing how quickly it all flowed. And he was helpful as far as um, guiding the the chapters, making an outline, and giving me ideas of how to to formulate the the structure of the book. And then, and he did all the uh, the video too, the, the the music background, and he did the the photos of of my hands making the read and the little video uh, snippets. So, yeah, I mean, he did the bulk of the work, I must say. He's really amazing. So the great thing about an iBook, um, because at first I had this same question, like, well, gosh, it's not going to be a hard copy, and how can people, how are they going to... Um, to, you know, read this if they have to have an iPad or a computer and... and the great thing about this has turned out to be that as I add more, which I, I, I haven't done, but I have plans, as I add more chapters to it or I think of other things that I'd like to put in, I can add the chapters to this book that's already out there. And anytime anyone updates their iTunes or iBook or you know, any time they do a, an update on their computer, it automatically will will forward to them. So I am in the process of writing some more chapters and sort of expanding on the book as soon as I have a few extra minutes to do that. But yeah, so um, I wish I could say that I came up with the idea of the read ebook, but I didn't. It was all <laughs> Kevin Chavez's brilliance and I was happy to just provide the information. Uh, well, staying on the topic of reads, could you maybe talk to us about your read making habits? So not necessarily the construction part, which the students can, of course, get from the ebook, but kind of more how you manage your time and your routines and also, you know, some advice or some good advice you've received on read making as we are all continually striving to be good, dedicated read makers. Sure. Well, I think that um, there are some parts of the read making process, as we know, that are pretty mindless and don't really take a lot of concentration. And you're actually going to probably be more apt to work on gouging cane and splitting cane and guillotining and all of that, this sort of processing, if it's not the only thing that you're doing at the time. So it's totally fine, I think, to be listening to music, to be watching TV, as long as there's not subtitles that you actually have to <laughs> TV for. But like 
to the the actual process processing of the cane. I think that you can um, you can be doing that while a lot of other things are going on, and that's probably helpful because it's it it's a, a little bit tedious and having the television on or uh, talking on the phone with your friends. I mean. Any, what, anything you can do to make those hours fly by. In fact, when my boys were little, my, my two children, my they would love to, they split cane like crazy, I would say. Oh, just put some cane for me. And they were five years old. They thought it was so fun. And they would split, split cane like crazy. And then, and then I have the crank pre-gouger too. So then I would, they'd split the cane for me. Which, unfortunately, once they got to be about six or seven years old, they didn't think it was as fun anymore. But <laughs> then I would guillotine it, find, you know, find the, the pieces, and they would love to put put it through that crank pre-gouger. Just, like, they could do that for hours. So that was great, but unfortunately, yeah, once they got to be about seven or eight years old, that wasn't any fun anymore. So I had to go back to doing it myself. <laughs> so, yeah. So generally, um, yeah, I will gouge, pre-gouge and gouge in in one sitting, and at and then I have a lot of cane that is sort of ready to go. I always shape and tie on in one sitting, so I would never shape cane and then let it dry out before I tie on. So generally, I'll I'll do four or five pieces of of shaping and tying on and then then I'll let those reeds dry out and then make them in a in a series of stages so I'm generally working on reeds in a variety of stages pretty much every day since you are very much known for your technical abilities you know also your musical abilities but you can play fast music really technical music so well can you talk to us a little bit about how you practice those technical passages so that they stick yeah a lot of people have asked me how I have fast technique and I don't really know the answer to that actually except that I I started the oboe relatively young like 10 years old and my teacher Mr. Mariani he was trained in Europe he grew up in Europe before he came over to the states and went to Curtis and studied with Tabato so he I I have I'm I'm incredibly fortunate to have had him as my teacher starting out for a number of reasons not only because he was a Tabato student and I just, you know, I'm only one generation away from that teaching. Um, but on the other uh, other side, the other side of the equation is that since he grew up in Europe where they really start students on technical things very quickly, um, I think more, more quickly than the typical American style of teaching, he had me playing really hard A2 books, like very hard A2 books, very young. So I was playing the grand studies when I was in sixth grade and I was playing the Jalay book, the hard, really hard Jalay book. I was playing that in seventh grade. So I really, I learned at a very young age, um, music that probably I would even think now is too difficult for a young student. Um, So learning young, learning the technique young, I think really did help me. Um, I also have noticed, or people have pointed out to me that I keep my fingers incredibly close to the keys. And I think that's very helpful too, because I'm just not really moving my fingers very much. They move just a couple millimeters actually from the key just down into the wood. So um, I'm always sort of, I always feel the silver of the keys on my fingers. We don't really have tone holes that we have to 
open and shut as much as you know a clarinet or something. So you can really keep your fingers hovering right over the keys and there's very little motion that has to occur. Um, and the, the motion is down from you know the finger down into the wood, not the finger across the key. So I think that is helpful. Um, so that said, of course, if I didn't continue practicing all of that, then my fingers wouldn't be as fast as they are. So I can't emphasize enough how important scales, arpeggios, and etude books are. I mean, they are meat and potatoes. They're everything. So you, you can spend hours and hours and hours practicing the Mozart concerto, but you can spend uh, 45 minutes of your day practicing the height book, that height foundation studies mm -hmm. book, in the key of C major, in the key of G major, in the key of F major. You can play a lot of technical studies and etudes, and then the Mozart concerto is not so difficult. It is not going to take hours and hours of practice every day. You can... I mean, of course, there's a lot to practice in the Mozart concerto, but um, I really feel that learning etude books and continuing to play etude books forever is crucial. It's really crucial. And and one example that Which, I tell my oh go ahead. oh sure one example that I tell my students is that I think we can't we can't think of an etude book as a textbook that we grew up with in grade school or something where when you you're you have your third grade math book and you're done with third grade math book and you go to the fourth grade math book and you never look back at the third grade math book but oboe etude books aren't like that we continue playing fairling etudes forever and we, we there's so much in them that we can still learn and improve on we continue playing Barrett Grand Studies forever. And there's so many. The Pascouli etude book is great too. There's so many. And they're not, um, it's not like we finish them and put them away and go on to another one. Playing etudes every day is, is crucial. I think you were going to ask which etude books. Yes, I was. <laughs> <laughs> okay. You took the words right out of my mouth. <laughs> okay. I'm glad right. that you mentioned that because, you know, a lot of times the students, I, in my experience, they get bored with, you know, the Barrett and the Fairling. They say, when can I be done with this book? But you're right. We're never done with the book. We always right. have to be back. Yeah. And, well, here's another great story. Um, in, in this, and this, I don't know this from personal experience, but this story was told to me and um, I think it's wonderful. So I repeat it a lot. That in the 70s, apparently, there was a great trumpet player who was from the Soviet Union at the time. And they were on tour and they came to the University of Michigan. And this trumpet player was known for his incredible technique and the fact that he could play anything. And all the trumpet players at the University of Michigan were so excited that this man was coming and giving a class. And when he gave the class... Uh, one of the students asked what etude books he used to get such great technique. And the guy said that he used the Arben book, that he played the Arben book. Well, the Arben book for trumpet is just like the Barrett is for us. It's the standard book. And so the trumpet player said, yeah, yeah, of course you played the Arben book, but, but then what did you play after that? And he said, I played the Arben book faster, mm. which is great. So basically, I mean, yeah, we learn our grand studies. And when we learn them in high school or college, they're at a certain level. And, and hopefully over the years, they get faster and smoother. And the drills get, you know, we're able to put three turns in instead of two, instead of one when you first started. And so there's constantly room for improvement. Um, okay, so the etude books. Uh, I love the Height Foundation Studies book, and I would start uh, any practice session with 
after you've warmed up and done some long tones and you're, you've got your air and your embouchure all set to go, I would go right into scales and arpeggios with the height book. Um, after that, I really love this uh, Sigismondo Singer book number three. So the Singer part three. That is a purely technical A2 book. There's a lot of the Singer books, actually. I think there's six of them, but I really love this number three. Um, that book really combines purely technical study with a little bit of melodic line to it. So it's not just scales and arpeggios, but it's it's primarily uh, just a technique book. And after that, I would then in a in a typical practice session go to something like the Fairling or Barrett Grand Studies, which at that point you're combining the technical facility that you learned that you worked on in the first two books, but now you're adding a level of a musical component and a, a musical architecture that has to be thought about. And uh, so your brain is having to do a lot more with each successive book that you go through. And at that point, uh, then you can start your repertoire. And I would say that that's a really good practice session or maybe two practice sessions divided up. Uh, but other great A2 books, uh, there's, well, there's a lot of them. I like Salviani. I like the Pasquale. I like Prestini. Um, I have a stack of them. I generally just get them out and play through an entire book in a sitting <laughs> um, you have such an illustrious performance career and one of the questions we really love to ask is um, a favorite memory of a past performance or performances that really stand out as you look back on your career uh, what are some favorite memories you have on stage oh wow oh that's good I should have thought about that before <laughs> 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 well, you know what? I think I would have to say um, the competition that I won in 1995, which was the third New York International Oboe Competition. They had it three times. It was Bert Lucarelli's brainchild and such a wonderful contribution to our oboe world mm -hmm. um, that two winners before me were Alex Klein and Jeff Rathbun. And I, uh, the third time they had this competition, I, I entered it. And at the time I had one, I think my oldest son was maybe three years old or something. I mean, I was, and I was teaching at the University of Illinois. I had just gotten there to the, to that position. And I hadn't been there for more than a year or two probably. And I was really busy at that point with a, a young child and, and a new job. And uh, so, you know, I did, I was feeling like I was at my limit of what I could handle. And this brochure for the competition came in the mail. And my husband said, oh, you should enter this. You, you have to send the tape. And I said, oh, I would have no chance. Are you kidding? I would have no chance. There are so many great oboe players out there. And he said, well, just, just put a tape together. So I put the tape together. And a couple months later, I received word that I was one of the, I guess, quarter finalists. And, and I'm trying to remember how many of us went to New York, but it was maybe 12 or 15 and at the time I had to book my flight to come back when I, you know, when I made my flight reservations and I thought, oh, I have no chance of, <laughs> of, of getting to the finals of this competition. So I didn't even book my plane flight to come back after the competition was over because I thought I'd be missing my little boy and I would go there and play a round or maybe two and 
So I, I had booked my plane flight to come back after the the semifinals of all <laughs> So, guys, I think there was a day in between the semifinals and finals. And so I thought, well, I, I, there's no way I'm going to be around there for two more days after that. And I have a three-year-old at home. So, um, yeah, so I, I went and I played the first round there. And they, and they called my name to go on to the second round of six. And I played that round and was ready to come home the next day. And they, they announced my name to be in the finals. And so I changed my ticket and um, I stayed on and obviously played the final round with um, the three finalists for that in that, that year of the competition, Rebecca Henderson, Eugene Isatoff, and myself were the three wow. finalists. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It was really, it was great. We played the, each of us played the uh, Mozart Concerto with the orchestra, and Mitch Miller was the conductor. We played at Lincoln Center, I think Avery Fisher Hall. And the other rounds had been um, in Weill Recital Hall in Carnegie Hall. So, yeah, I would say that the final round of that competition um, was incredibly memorable. Um, for another reason, too, and, and that is that when I went out to play the Mozart Concerto, the first movement really didn't go well. I mean, I, I was ready, although, you know, remember that I had booked my plane ticket and I never thought I was going to play the Mozart Concerto because <laughs> <And laughs> I didn't think that I was going to be in the final. So I just really threw that thing together. I hadn't practiced it. I, had, I threw it together the day before and because I really thought I'd be home by that point. And I had worked really hard on all my other repertoire, the, the, you know, the Berio Sequenza that I played, you know, the day before. And so, um, yeah, so I practiced my tail off for a day and a half on that Mozart concerto <laughs> to get up there and play it. And the first movement just, it, I was not grooving at all. And I, some of my trills weren't working. I thought it, and I just didn't think it was going well, which it wasn't. And um, and I got about halfway through that first movement and thought, oh, my gosh, this is terrible. I want to just you know, walk off the stage at this point. But I, I kept it together. And then, you know, the, the cadenza went pretty well. And I thought, OK, I'm back at this. And then then I thought, you know what, I think that. I'm going to pour my heart and soul into this second movement and, and see if I can um, redeem myself with my uh, interpretation and expression of the slow movement, which I think is one of the most beautiful pieces of music that we have. And so I tried my hardest and did, I hope did exactly that and just felt like, well, you know, if I, if, if I leave at the end of this um, performance, at least I know that I, I put my heart and soul into this slow movement and I was really happy with it. And with that confidence, I went on to the third movement and I felt like it went really well. So I think that that performance was not only just an incredible experience to be a part of that competition, to be with the, level of oboe players that were all around me um, and of course to to be ultimately the winner of the competition but also it proved to me that um, even when you think things aren't necessarily going their best in any performance to not give up to sort of dig in and make the next movement or the next phrase the one that um is going to propel you to the next level and sort of get you back on track. And I remember that performance vividly because of that um, mindset that I basically had to uh, dig down and reach in and, and, and propel myself to the next level. It sort of proves you can be a musician and a human at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> Eureka! <laughs> yeah. 
Nancy, what would you say to a younger version of yourself? What would I say to a younger version of myself? Well, I think the most important thing that I would say is to never forget the privilege that we have to be doing what we're doing and that it is such a, an honor and a privilege to be a musician, an oboist, and to be in this community of oboe players, musicians, teachers, pedagogues, performers. Um, and that even when sometimes we get incredibly busy or we feel like there's a lot going on or um, when sometimes we feel like we have a lot of irons in the fire and we're sort of um, at our limit of what we can do, that it is a huge uh, privilege to be in this musical community and to get and to do what we do every day. And for me, walking in to school every day and teaching my wonderful students and and playing this beautiful music, I, I can't imagine a better career and a better life and better people to surround myself with. Um, so I think just to always be appreciative of what we have is probably the most important thing that we can carry forward into, in our career and, and into our musical life. Awesome. Well, this interview has just been amazing. We can't thank you enough for your time. Where can our listeners find you on the internet? Okay. Well, gosh, I have a fledgling website, which is really awful. (laughs) 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 I sort of tried to put it together myself and eventually, yeah, if anyone out there is really good at websites and wants to help me with mine or, or redo mine, that would be fabulous. Um, but there is a website out there, nancyambroseking.com. I also have a lot of videos on YouTube. I have um, a, a whole channel of oboe bassoon piano trios and duos, the Via Lobos duos on there with um, Jeff Lyman. And I have a channel of my own called, I think it's 62 Oboe. That's the year I was born. And there's a lot of so I think if you just search me on YouTube there's a lot um yeah and I'm on Facebook which is fun and you're welcome to (laughs) everyone's welcome to friend me I have lots of friends on Facebook I think and can you remind us the title of your ebook also oh sure yeah so the ebook is making read start to finish with Nancy Ambrose King great Thank you so much, Nancy. This was so eye-opening and inspiring. We really appreciate you coming on. Of course. My pleasure. Thanks for asking. So that is it for episode eight. Thank you so much for joining us. We hope that your spring break is extremely restful and relaxing. And join us again next time for an interview with Billy Short, Principal Bassoon in the Metropolitan Opera Orchestra. In the meantime, you can find us on our website at doublereaddish.com, on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. And you can email us at doublereaddish at gmail.com. Thank you so much for listening. We'll see you next time.